morning to all of you and uh, thank you very much for getting me here to Thrissur. It's a pleasure to be here and it's always a pleasure to visit Kerala because the kind of hospitality and personal touch is given. I think no one can match you. Thank you very much Thrissur ISA to have me here and thank you chairpersons for that kind introduction. Am I audible? Okay, the topic is about why is this topic so important in current era? Now, the issue about pharmacogenotics, geno uh, genetics, and how it is going to impact the anesthesia practice or medical practice in future is what we need to consider, because that is what the future of medicine is going to be. We have already published a review article now in the current issue of anesthesia. So as a background, please go through it. It's got in details about how the pharmacogenetics can actually modify your dosages and patient reactions. So we are already on to a PhD project of doing this pharmacogenetics of fentanyl. So all this is online. You can have a look at it. Now, why is it important that the future of medicine is going to change? Currently, what we practice is a heterogeneous group of people who are prescribed with the same diagnosis, a same prescription, and the dosage of a drug. Now, out of these patients, the heterogenic patients, you'll find that some of them, the drug is non-toxic but beneficial. In another group, you will find that the drug is toxic but beneficial. In the third group, you will find that the drug is toxic and not beneficial at all. Only side effects persist. And in the fourth group, it's like a placebo. It's neither toxic nor beneficial. The problem came when we did a group of about 70 patients who were receiving antiplatelets who had stents. And believe me, 30% of them were underdosed with the standard dosages of antiplatelets which were given. So not all of us respond in the same way to the dosages of drugs which are prescribed to us. And some of them may be life-threatening. A couple of patients can just bleed to death even with a normal dosage of drug which you give. So the same diagnosis, same prescription is no more going to stay there. Things are going to change when we have to individualize drug therapies to make sure that at least we avoid the adverse drug reactions and toxic effects. We improve the therapeutic efficacy and also improve the outcomes of the patients. So the tailored drug regime should be of a right drug with the right dosage to elicit the right response. That's the objective which the current modern day medicine practice has to establish and accept. Now, how do we go about, what's the background behind this? So just to look about the structure and activity of DNA and genes. So this is a double helix which all of us are very familiar with, right? This is a double helix strand. Let us unfold it and see how do they run. These chains which are wound together, when they are straightened up, they run actually opposite to each other. So they will run in opposite directions, and there is a hydrogen bond which actually binds these two chains together. A single nucleotide in the DNA comprises of a sugar moiety and a phosphate group. And in between these two are the nitrogenous pairs of amino acids. Basically, these are the four amino acids and the fifth one which are there. These are called nitrogenous pairs. And these pairs should be existing at a particular site onto the DNA. If at that particular site, this sequence is changed, then it is described as polymorphism. So you'll have these pairs, and you have a single nucleotide structure, which I already described consists of a phosphate group. It consists of a sugar moiety, and these two are bound by a nitrogenous base, which will have different base pairs of amino acids placed at a particular site or, or, or place. Now, what is a single nucleotide poly polymorphism? It is when the 
base pairs at a particular site get changed to another base pair. So that's just called a single nucleotide polymorphism. So this is in short to tell you how genes can actually affect the handling of, of the drugs which we normally do. Let's take an example of analgesics, opioids. Yes, they both have intrinsic pain mechanisms, but what we need to consider is that the pharmacodynamics of these drugs and pharmacokinetics can be altered. Pharmacodynamics can be altered by an altered drug receptor because it's a protein drug receptor, we call it as G protein, and drug efflux molecules which are basically present in the central nervous system. How pharmacokinetics can be altered by, meta, uh, by gene uh, polymorphism? The drug absorption and distribution can be affected, and most importantly, it's the drug metabolism, the cytochrome 450 enzyme system, which can be affected. So let's just go one by one into each one of them. What's this drug receptor? Most of the drugs in anesthetic practice are bound to protein-coupled G receptors. They are present to handle many of the drugs which we normally use. And if you look at them, they are heterotrimers, they are called molecular amplifiers. The G protein consists of three parts. It has got a gamma and it has got a beta and alpha parts which are joined together to form a G alpha beta gamma complex. And this complex is stable and it only dissociates when a receptor binds to the G receptor protein complex to produce an intracellular mechanisms of signal pathway and it will create a transcription for the drug from the molecule. How does, it, how does it happen? So as soon as a drug molecule combines to this G receptor protein complex, you'll find the GTP gets converted to GTP and this activated alpha G complex separates out from the protein receptor, goes to the adrenal cyclase, activates, and therefore produces the second messenger, which is the cyclic AMP. And finally, the cyclic AMP, through the cellular mechanism, goes inside the nucleus to produce the transcription and the drug response of the cell. So, which are the receptors which we normally want to consider? These are the opioid receptors as far as the IUPHAR classification goes, and the respected genes which are present there are underlined. The most important one which we need to consider is the OPRM1 gene, which is associated, associated with mu receptors, because that's the one which causes analgesia, and we commonly use that. Now, there is a problem with this gene because a single altered amino acid sequence, when adenine is replaced by guanine at position 118, can cause an increased opioid requirements. These patients are not very sensitive to opioids, and you'll find that they need increased amount of opioids to give them an analgesic effect. Now, the second one we talked about was the drug efflux molecule. Now, this is done by P glycoproteins. Normally, what happens is, from the blood, the narcotic molecules goes across the blood-brain barrier through passive diffusion, but it has to be expelled out of the central neural cells by means of ATP dependence energy. So it has to be actively expelled out. This is normal from the brain cells. When there is a polymorphism, which is called as MDR1 polymorphism, the drug molecule goes inside through the passive diffusion, but the ATP there, because of the nucleotide polymorphism, is not able to expel it out from the CNS, so they can have adverse opioid overdose mechanisms. So they, these are the kind of polymorphisms which can happen, which can alter the effect of narcotics, which we commonly use in our day-to-day -day practice. Now, this P glycoprotein, which is an active efflux transporter across the blood-brain barrier, 
It has two common single nucleotide polymorphisms at the position. These are the positions which have been identified. They enhance the entry of opioids into the central nervous system, specifically of morphine, methadone, fentanyl, sufentanyl, and L-fentanyl. And they can reproduce adverse opioid overdose. Now let's come to the pharmacokinetic effects as far as drug absorption, distribution, and metabolism is concerned. So I'm going to focus on metabolism primarily because these are the microsomal enzyme system present in the liver, which is, present for, which is responsible for the metabolism of various drugs which we use during anesthesia. So what are these enzymes responsible for? For phase one reaction, for phase two reactions, because they convert the metabolite, form a metabolite which can be easily excreted through the urine. So about 70 to 80% of the drug metabolism undergoes phase one metabolism. Now what is this cytochrome P40 family? It is one, two, and three divided into three aspects. So one is again subdivided into various subsections. You have a greater family two, and then you have a larger one, which is the CYP3 family. And then the last one are the non-P450 enzyme systems which are there. Which are the enzymes where we as an anesthetist are concerned? It is only the CYP2 family and CYP3 family that we need to consider. Rest of them do not take place, do not play an active form, active uh, uh, role in drug metabolism to the anesthetic agents which you use. The oxidative metabolism, which is by far the most commonest one, which I told you about 70 to 80% drugs metabolize through this. All opioids, benzodiazepines, and especially lignocaine undergo this, but you do not need any dose adjustments for its polymorphism. So essentially, 70% of the drugs, even if there is a polymorphism of C5, a CYP3 family, we do not have to bother. The inhalational agents, although they do not go any biotransformation, a very small amount of it undergoes biotransformation in the liver by this CYP2E1 family. But what we need to consider is the most important one, which is the CYP2D6 family, because these are responsible for about 25% reactions, and they can cause 1,000-fold different increase in the metabolism. And therefore, they can lead to adverse drug reactions. So adverse drug reaction, if there's a polymorphism of CP2D6 family, can, can affect tremadol, methadone, oxycodone, and ondansetron. CYP2C9 family is responsible for polymorphisms in NSH, phenytoin, and warfarin. And the small group of them, when we use proton pump inhibitors, phenytoin, diazepam, barbiturates, and nemetriptyline, is responsible for the CY2, uh, P2C19. But basically, let's focus on the, the orange one, which is the CYP2D6 family. What can they do? If there is a functional alley, then it is a poor metabolism. But if there are two functional alleys, which the majority of the cases happen, they can produce extensive metabolism. But if they have three or more functional alleys, then it can cause very ultra-rapid metabolism. So if there is a poor metabolism, it can cause adverse drug reactions. On the contrary, if there is an ultra-rapid metabolism, it can cause decreased drug effects. Both of them can happen, specifically when we talk about codeine. Now let's consider what codeine can perform or do. Codeine is generally met is metabolized in the liver by undergoing demethylation, and a small amount of it undergoes metabolism by the CYP3 family as well. It is converted into morphine to produce analgesia, and then it is demethylated and glucuronidated to produce codeine clearance. So the CYP3 is responsible for clearance of codeine, and CYP2 is responsible for producing analgesic effects. If there is a polymorphism or CYP2D6 
enzyme system. There can be either poor metabolism, which can cause inadequate analgesia, or ultra-rapid metabolism, which can cause opioid intoxication. And because there is ultra-rapid metabolism, there is concomitant inhibition of the other pathway, and more and more of codeine is there in the system. It is not cleared off to produce opioid intoxication. So this is how codeine metabolism can affect. And mind you, most of the children abroad, when they're born, if they are prescribed codeine, they are always screened for this CYP2D6 enzyme system polymorphism before they are prescribed codeine. The most commonest one which we are always worried about is the pseudocholine esterase. And there are different variants which are there. The defective gene LE is in about 4% patients. And it is responsible for metabolism of succamethonium, mimocurium, etracurium, and others. There are variants from A, K, F, J, H, and S. But the most commonest and the most feared one is the one which can produce prolonged apnea for more than five minutes, almost till one hour. S variant can produce prolonged apnea for almost eight hours. So these are the kind of pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic changes which can happen with altered gene profiles of the patients. And we really need to be careful when we prescribe these drugs to our patients. Specific, specifically the opioids, what should be the dose? What should be the patients who are sensitive to it? It is good that they are screened from them. Thank you very much.